All right, so this is uh, a tour, uh, a talk that was actually a talk by commission that a, a few weeks ago I received an email from Dorit asking me very specifically uh, to speak about the embezzlement of entanglement and monogamy uh, and sort of listing some things that she was interested in. Uh, and so I was very happy to do that. Uh, and in particular, uh, well, I guess what we're going to be discussing today uh, is some kind of entanglement, uh, you know, quantum mechanical analog of this little uh, common uh, trick that you see right there, that we have six plane figures and we can just slide them around. And if we slide them around appropriately, we seem to have created area out of nothing. And we're going to see uh, ways that we, it looks like we can create entanglement out of nothing. Of course, we can't. Uh, that would be a violation of the laws that I'm getting, getting to. But uh, the fact that we can come close to doing it seems to have some interesting applications. So the structure of the talk uh, is first, uh, you know, the first law that we're going to be discussing is the fact that entanglement cannot be created without interaction. And you know, the evasion strategy is going to be embezzlement. And then there are going to be a number of applications. And this is going to be most, if not all, of the talk in the end. Because Dorit asked me to also speak about monogamy. And so I have a little bit to say about monogamy. But there's been so much good material about monogamy over the course of the past few days that you probably don't need to hear too much more. So if I <laughs> manage to make it this far, all I'm going to tell you about is a very, very simple manifestation of monogamy. Uh, my original ambition was to try to take you through the proof of uh, Fernando and Aram's uh, limitations on quantum C PCP, but uh, squeezing in both the, uh, the embezzlement and that turned out to be overly ambitious. So uh, that won't appear. Um, thanks to Fernando, I managed to learn how it worked, but I won't be able to share it with you. Uh, all right, so the Great Laws, part one. Uh, this is something I think is familiar, familiar to all of you. If you have some density operator, rho A, B for a composite quantum system, A part and B part, and then you have some uh, noisy operation that acts uh, in a product, uh, product fashion on the A and the B parts. So again, for those of you who are not familiar with this, I think there may be a few of you in the audience, the quantum mechanical analog of a, double, of a stochastic map is a completely positive trace preserving map. But you can formalize all those things. Uh, and what you, and you, you have a data processing inequality that if you look at the mutual information before you started, which is simply defined as, uh, in the obvious way, the entropy of rho restricted to A uh, plus the entropy of rho restricted to B minus the joint entropy of rho AB, uh, that that cannot increase under these product operations. Right? So you can't create correlation from nothing. Um, now, what is embezzlement? Uh, well, embezzlement, roughly speaking, is theft from a reservoir of wealth so vast that no one notices that you've committed a crime. Right, that's uh, in the ideal world. And this is the uh, malapropically named uh, Bernie Madoff, who made off with hundreds of millions of dollars of his, own, of his client's money. And of course, no one notices, you know, until they do, uh, that he, <laughs> that's a more current photo. Um, all right, so what are we going to do with <laughs> when we embezzle entanglement? Uh, our perfect crime is going to be that we start off with some entanglement reservoir. Right? So this is this quantum state phi. Uh, and imagine this is going to be a large store of entanglement. Uh, and then we also start off with some system in a product state. You know, Alice has a zero and Bob has a zero. And we're going to want to convert that by unitary operations uh, to, again, vast store of entanglement and some target state psi. So just more pictorially, again, here's our entanglement bank. We start off with a product state in our target register. We act unitarily. You know, Alice does something on her side. Bob does something on his side. Uh, and what we'd like to get out is uh, a new state where we have, again, the original entanglement bank phi uh, and the target state psi, which to be non-trivial is not a product state, but some kind of entangled state. So this would be perfect embezzlement. But this is also obviously impossible, because it, it violates the, you know, the first great law that I showed you on the previous slide, uh, that if we look at uh, the original mutual information, we'll have the mutual information for the state phi plus the mutual information of a product state, which is 0. Uh, and then afterwards, we'd have the mutual information for the state phi plus the mutual information for the state psi. So if, state is a cor so if psi is a correlated state or an entangled state of any type, we will have increased the mutual information by acting locally, which is yeah, impossible. Uh, so this cannot, uh, this cannot be done. Right? This, is, uh, this is fault. You know, this is, uh, well, impossible. Um, I guess I should have said that, right? Um, well, actually, there's a, there is a sense in which it can be done. Right? There's a trivial solution to this problem, which is just to have an infinite reservoir of entanglement. Not a very, very large reservoir, but infinite. And if you steal you know, a dollar from an, you know, 
from an, a, a bank with an infinite amount of money, the bank still has an infinite amount of money. And you can, uh, I, unfortunately, I wasn't at the discussion yesterday because I was preparing this talk, uh, but I think there was, there was uh, some discussion of the extent to which this is actually uh, sort of a valid statement. And from the mathematical perspective, at least, you can formalize this and you, you can really make it a, a rigorously you know, valid statement. Um, the physical re re relevance is less clear, right? Like, uh, whether you, because in practice, you never have access to an infinite number of degrees of freedom that you can control effectively. Um, and so if we, if we want to think about the physical relevance of entanglement, we probably should be thinking about finite, you know, finite dimensional models, but not entirely. I know Marius might have an objection, so let's let's. I don't have an objection. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. So that, yeah, the data processing uh, inequality is satisfied. Yeah, yeah, that's the loophole uh, in this case. Uh, that you, you can't, you know, mathematically you can't have this uh, perfect uh, perfect embezzlement. Um, whether you could ever achieve it physically is less clear. Um, so let's actually proceed to make it clear at least that this this effect is potentially physically relevant. Um, well, I guess here are the drawbacks, right? Even the Federal Reserve does not have an infinite amount of entanglement. Um, but there's actually another. Uh, draw, drawback with this scheme, because um, I haven't told you exactly what I want to achieve yet. Um, but at least this form of embezzlement, where we have an infinite number of copies of psi, only works if we want to embezzle size. Right? Uh, and I would like to be more ambitious now. I would like to actually uh, construct a scheme where there's a single embezzling state from which I can embezzle anything I want, any, you know, any, any bipartite quantum state, as long as it's not too big. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to achieve. And how do we achieve it? Well, uh, um, one way to do it is to use these embezzling states. Uh, so this is a, a class of bipartite quantum states that uh, Wim Van Dam and I introduced in 2002. Uh, and the structure of them is just that the Schmidt coefficient, so it's a, you know, Alice and Bob are using the same, uh, the same basis, ortho uh, orthonormal basis, and the coefficients out front are 1 over square root of j. So if you want to think in terms of the eigenvalues of the reduced density operator, uh, the eigenvalues are proportional to the harmonic sequence, 1 over j. Uh, and so the normalization constant here is roughly, cn is roughly log n. Uh, and now the ambition, of course, uh, the data processing inequality does apply because it's the finite dimensional state. Uh, and so we cannot embezzle perfectly. Um, and all we're going to be able to achieve now is some approximation. All right? Uh, and the, the little theorem that we proved is that for every pure state psi on A prime B prime, whatever it is, of, uh, of Schmidt rank M, again, that's just jargon for those of you who aren't used to that, uh, but the Schmidt rank is just the, the rank of the reduced density operator. So a very coarse measure of how much entanglement is there. Uh, there exist unitary transformations on the Alice side and the, and the Bob side that will convert one of these embezzling states and a product state into the embezzling state and a target and the inner product is going to be at least 1 minus uh, the log of the Schmidt rank of the target over the Schmidt rank uh, of the embezzling state. Uh, so if you want to get a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little, maybe a little bit easier to see, if you want this inner product to be 1 minus epsilon, then you have to blow up the number of qubits. Your embezzling state has to be 1 over epsilon times the size of your target state. And that's not too bad. That's a, that's a polynomial blow up. Uh, yeah, so it's not, it's not outrageously large, it's not infinite, um, and, uh, and so, so that's the statement. Now I should say that when Wim and I uh, came up with this, uh, we just thought it was a, you know, it was a curiosity. Um, you know, it, was, it was kind of cool that you could do this, uh, but at the time, um, I guess the quantum information world was very focused on state transformations and the amount of entanglement required to con convert from one state to another. And there was, a, you know, th there was a lot of excitement about the idea of catalysis, right? This kind of looks like catalysis, that we started with this state phi and 0, 0, and we catalytically transform it to phi and something else. Um, but you damage the catalyst in the process here. So it's not really you know, because of this 1 minus epsilon. And so we're not really operating catalytically. We're sort of damaging the catalyst as we go. Uh, and so we thought it was, a, you know, it was a cheat. It was neat. 
but because the only thing that ever mattered in the world, obviously, was how much entanglement you consumed, no one would ever use this for anything. Um, and in fact, we even had some difficulty publishing it for precisely that reason, that the, uh, you know, the, the referees were sort of steeped in the same uh, you know, prejudices as us. Uh, and that's kind of how it stood for several years. You know, no one used it for anything. And it's kind of been gratifying that in the past few years, it's found a number of applications in quantum complexity. Uh, but before getting to those applications, let's just see how it works. Um, so I'll just show you how to embezzle uh, a bell pair, because <coughs> that's the easiest case. Um, things get a little bit more combinato combinatorially complicated for other types of states, but you, you get the picture if you, if you look at this one. So uh, let's just look at the Schmidt coefficients. So the state phi n, our embezzling state, here are the Schmidt coefficients, uh, the normalization, and then the, uh, the square root of the harmonic sequence. And then if we look at the embezzling state and our target, tensored with our target, here's the whole collection of Schmidt coefficients. Right? Each one from the original is doubled and multiplied by 1 over square root 2 from here. Uh, now, if we wanted to convert the embezzling state, tensored 0, 0, so there are a bunch of z trailing zeros here that I've left out, uh, into phi n tensor psi, what should we do? Uh, well, we should just actually align the Schmidt coefficients uh, or try to transform, transform the Schmidt coefficients of phi n into the Schmidt coefficients of phi n tensor psi, right? Um, that, that's what we should. That's what we should try to do, right? Because we can, uh, we can permute, by locally acting on a and b, we can permute the Schmidt, the Schmidt bases, right? So we have the freedom to reorder these Schmidt coefficients. And so if we can just find a way to reorder the Schmidt coefficients such that the uh, the dot product between them is large, that tells us that we can actually embezzle. So the obvious way to reorder the Schmidt coefficients is just you know, order them largest to smallest. Right? So we just order them largest to smallest and look at the inner product. And what do we get? Well, we'll pick up uh, 1 over square root of Cn squared. So there's 1 over Cn, which is uh, 1 over log n, right? the, harmonic, uh, the har harmonic sum that we're using to normalize. Um, uh, and then we'll have the inner product of 1 over square root of 1 times 1 over square root of 2. Uh, which is at least a half. And then we actually have a half. And then 1 over square root of 3 times 1 over square root of 4, which is at least 1 over 4, and then an actual 4, and so on. Right? So that's what the inner product looks like. Uh, but this inner product is actually just a half plus a half, which is 1, plus a quarter plus a quarter, or sorry, a, well, a quarter plus a quarter, which is a half. So this, the, uh, all the way up to two, 1 over n plus 1 over n, which is 2 over n. So that we've now bounded this inner product by another harmonic sum. Right? And so this thing in the parentheses uh, is roughly the harmonic sum from 1 over 1 to 2 over n. So it's roughly the log of n over 2. Uh, and so we have a lower bound on the inner product of log of n over 2 over log n, which is about 1 minus the log of 2 over log n. Uh, and of course, log of 2 here is the Schmidt rank of our target state. Right? That's exactly the role that it's playing. And it turns out that the hardest, you know, uh, the um, the state that is hardest to embezzle physically uh, is the maximally entangled state like this. It's actually the easiest state to embezzle mathematically, right? the, if I want to illustrate to you how it works. that If we had other kinds of Schmidt coefficients, the problem is that when you reorder things, uh, the way that you reorder coefficients becomes more complicated. Uh, but it turns out that the, uh, the, the lower bound, uh, the worst lower bound you get for these maximally entangled states. Uh, so that's how you, that's how you embezzle. Uh, with these, uh, these states that we, uh, we found way back when. So since then, uh, there has been some further development. Yes? Uh, so and now if you were to pull this apart and say, um, you know, instead of just lining up coefficients, if you were to describe what the procedure would be, is that easy to describe? Or? Oh, sure. Uh, so let's see. Um, we, we have found a permutation that takes the Schmidt coefficients of phi n uh, almost, uh, rather, so phi n was already in this order. Uh, and then we uh, found a permutation on the, um, the Schmidt coefficients of phi n tensor psi that aligns them very well with the Schmidt coefficients of phi n. Right? So what we, what we do is we, we'd apply the inverse of that permutation. Uh, 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 and then, so, sorry, so what I was asking was, once you unwind it, is there a nice description right. in terms of yeah, well, wait, it, 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 I mean, it looks like if J were to be written in binary, let's say, then you're just like yanking out the most or the least significant bit. 
Oh, maybe that's actually another way of thinking about it. Okay. Uh, right. It doesn't log in bound. Like that? Maybe for the login bound, that's enough. I mean, maybe if you want to improve, depending on this card hit state, you'd be more fancy. But oh yeah. Do you uh, I mean, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, actually, I don't know. The the only lower bound we bothered to prove was this log of Schmidt Schmidt rank over log n. Uh, so I don't know the extent. I mean, you should be able to do a little bit better with other states, but we haven't analyzed how much better you can do. Um, yeah. Can you tell me that Alice and Bob perform a permutation matrix? Um, well, assuming that the that uh, so they are essentially permutation matrices. Like you have to write psi in its Schmidt basis as well, uh, and then once you've done that, it's a the permutation matrices. Yeah. But only Alice is doing that. Um, no, Alice and Bob both have to do it because they have to move the sh they have to move the Schmidt coefficients the around, the yeah, so that they agree on uh, on the Schmidt decomposition. And is it always that you reorder them increasingly in the second state? So that's that's the how you maximize the other target state. Yeah. So that, that will always be optimal. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> other questions? Is there any way that this state is optimal for this process? Ah, good question. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit on the next slide. Um, OK. So some further developments. Again, not much happened for quite a while. Uh, but then there's this paper by uh, Debbie, Ben Toner, and John Watchers, nominally from 2013, which is when it was published. But if you look on the archive, it appeared in 2008. So, uh, yeah. Um, and they did a number of interesting things in that paper, uh, but the one that I'd like to focus on just for the moment uh, is that they also showed that you can embezzle uh, multi-party states, not just bipartite states. Um, but the strategy is extremely inefficient. Uh, so the blow up, rather than being polynomial, is doubly exponential um, in the size of the state. Uh, and so it can be done in principle, but you might object to it not being very practical. Um, so another interesting uh, development just this year uh, is that uh, Eric Deneur, uh, Thomas, and uh, Stur, I don't remember his first name, uh, came up with a robust embezzlement protocol. So in the, in the problem that I just described to you, Alice and Bob both agree on the target state psi. Right? Um, but you can imagine a situation where Alice and Bob are, you know, don't quite agree on what state they're trying to make. Um, and because uh, that can affect the ordering of the Schmidt coefficients, that could, in principle, lead to uh, some problem. But uh, what they've shown is that even if Alice and Bob don't quite agree on the target state, there's a robust version of the embezzlement procedure that will, uh, will succeed. And they call this uh, quantum correlated sampling. I'm not talking about applications here except for this one, because I'm not going to explain anything more about it. But it turns out that that's, uh, proving this uh, quantum correlated sampling lemma is a key step in their proof of uh, parallel repetition for projection games. Um, also, uh, it, I guess in 2003, uh, Debbie and uh, a student uh, looked at characteristics of these u universal embezzling fam families. Right? Is this state that I wrote down for you the only one? Is there more that you can do? And they showed that uh, you can perturb the coefficients a little bit, but there's not, there's not a lot of room. Um, but, it, but doing so didn't seem to buy them very much. That if your goal was to do uh, universal, uh, universal embezzlement, uh, that didn't seem to improve on the fidelity. Um, and uh, and so that's, that's what it is. Um, and coming out this year, uh, so I've received some advance notice, although no paper, uh, uh, people in the mathematical physics and operator algebras uh, community, um, well, and also our, our quantum information, Reinhard Werner, uh, Volker Schultz, um, are writing a paper they call the universal embezzling algebra. Um, and they show some, you know, they're going to prove in that paper some type of uniqueness for I'm, I'm writing in quotes eigenvalue scaling. Uh, in the limit of infinite dimensions, where you can do perfect, uh, perfect embezzlement. Um, so um, there's a, a whole formal, you know, there's mathematical formalism one can use to talk about it, and they're going to do that. And one of the consequences, which was known sort of in some sense earlier, uh, but this may, you may find this interesting, that if you have a free quantum field theory, so a non-interacting quantum field theory, it turns out that every valid state in the theory is an embezzling state. All right, so it's not just that these embezzling states are kind of rare things. In fact, if you just take any pure state of the system, uh, and then chop, you know, chop it in half, you know, make an A and a B, uh, what you have there is embezzling. Um, and that be a faithful state? Sorry? Shouldn't that be a faithful state? A what state? A faithful, I mean, okay. 
Oh, um, it, has to be it will. Well, yeah, so it, it, it will be faithful once you look at the uh, sum system. Yeah. Um, okay. So this all seems to be very, you know, very recent developments, modulo, you know, the late submission to the journal. Uh, but I think we'd be remiss in not uh, acknowledging, in fact, that there's much, you know, there are much, much earlier developments in this business of embezzling. Uh, and going all the way back, really, to the late 1960s, when people were thinking about the classification of von Neumann algebras, you know, they weren't using the language of embezzlement. You know, we're much better at marketing in the quantum information community. Uh, but uh, I believe it was Araki who noticed um, that for certain types of von Neumann algebras, uh, you could have some effect that was essentially embezzling. And this is a kind of invariant that separated those algebras from others. And so this was a, some step in the classification of uh, of infinite dimensional von Neumann algebras. Which von Neumann Sorry? Which von Neumann Type three. <coughs> yeah. Um, okay, so so the story is an old one. Yeah. Can I add another early one? Oh, sure. Yeah. I think uh, in the single party case, it corresponds to having a coherent uh, state interacting with a spin. And that explains why we can manipulate NMR spins without being coherent. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. So like in the same sense that if, like if you have a, an optical coherent state and you lose some photons, it remains a coherent state? Yeah. Uh, because the, the coherent thing that leaves the system does not change very much. It does not have spin space. Uh, so where are the harmonic, uh, I have no idea, where's the harmonic I, sequence I in there? I don't understand right. uh, well, spins. The harmonic state, I mean, the coherent state, mm -hmm. the coefficient of the Fox state is like 1 over there's a factorial, though. Right. So yeah, it's not right. harmonic, but it's... But, you know, it's well, factorial is a lot different. No, no. Yeah. It's, think yeah. of the n in the coherent state. The number of photons corresponds to the number of EPR pairs. So imagine a superposition mm -hmm. of EPR pairs that's Poisson distributed. Then if you uh, remove one, you get approximately back the same state. So right. that's the connection. Okay, good. Uh, so, so, so the effect has been noticed in, in, you know, in, other, in other avenues before. Yeah, Perry. State at random, um, then it is, is the hyperprobability embezzling? Is, is that true? Uh, like, if you have finite dimensional Hilbert space and yeah. you choose a state at random? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's too entangled. Um, so, um, like, a, random states in the Hilbert space are almost maximally entangled. Yeah. And it turns out that maximally entangled states are not, they're, they're good for embezzling maximally entangled states. Uh, but they're not good for embezzling these other types of states because you somehow need enough. Uh, Aaron would use the word spread uh, in the in the Schmidt coefficients uh, to be able to reproduce any distribution that you're trying to make. Uh, so it has to look like the one that you. Yeah, like, I mean, essentially, that's just it. Like the, uh, there is this, uh, you know, in some asymptotic limit, this kind of uniqueness result that it essentially this is the only possibility. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be case regularly, right? I mean, I think it just has to decay and not too fast and not too slow. So that's possible. And ha having not seen you know, their, their paper, I'm not sure. But Volcker did say to me that it really had to look like, you know, look like 1 over the, um, I guess, what's it called? The, the spectral scale mm -hmm. uh, has to look like 1 over, one over t um, in, you know, in some limit. Um, Uh, your protocol does not need communication between the parties, right? Not even classical. No. Uh, can, uh, is it, can one do better if one allows classical communication? Um, well, if you allow classical communication, then you can embezzle with EPR. You know, with a large, you know, an infinite store of EPR pairs allows you to embezzle anything because once you have EPR pairs, you can just convert, you know, degrade them, dilute yeah. them into other types of entanglement. Um, so in that sense, you can do better. Um, in terms of the fidelity, I think you might be able to do somewhat better. Just Sorry? Um, oh, so you do it exactly. Yeah. What, what, but you still have to you still have to embezzle the original state to do the teleportation. Right? Like you want I mean if you if you want so if you had an infinite number of EPR pairs, you embezzle one and then you can teleport and you've done everything perfectly. But if you just have a, a finite embezzling state you know, the state you're going to teleport through will not be in perfect fidelity. 
Um, but that does give a strategy. So I mean, I, I haven't analyzed it. I don't, I don't because, know. Because if you have like a fast EPR pair, so you lose one. Uh, this is totally non like 999 EPR pairs is very non close to a thousand. This is true. I mean, it, and for an infinite number, it's the same. But uh, yeah, so um, the only well, there, there actually. So there are other strategies. Like, uh, yeah, no, you can do better. You can do better uh, because in their paper, uh, Debbie, uh, well, Leung, Toner, and Watrous, they came up with another family of a of embezzling states that are targeted for embezzling a specific state. Right. So these, I've been talking about universal embezzling states here. But if you, want, if you want to embezzle just some specific state, uh, then you can use theirs, and you'll get a better scaling of the fidelity. And then you, uh, you, and then you teleport. Yeah. 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 yeah, so you, I think you can do better. Um, at least better than the known yeah, strategy. Other questions? Oh, wow. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Uh, OK, so let's actually see what we would use this for. Um, there have been a lot of really beautiful depictions of two-player yeah, games, so I'm going to compete here for the ugliest depiction of a two-player game. Um, but here we have Alice and Bob. Alice on the left, Bob on the right. Alice gets a question A, Bob gets a question B. Uh, and Alice performs a, a measurement indexed by the question, likewise for Bob, and then their outcomes J and K. And they share some quantum state. And the quantum value of the game is the supremum over the dimension uh, of the Hilbert space in which rho lives, dimension over the measure, or supremum over the measurement, supremum over the state, of the average over the distribution of questions, of the payoff function, and then the probability of the, the outcomes, right? The same formula we've been seeing many times. Um, so one trivial, well, I shouldn't say trivial, but this was observed in 2010, uh, there's a supremum over the state here. But we can, we can remove the supremum over the state and just always use the same embezzling state. Right? Because we know that in the limit of large dimension, that will allow us to recover any possible measurement statistics uh, that we want uh, with arbitrarily high fidelity. Right? So at least uh, in this sense, um, the, the embez you know, the, these embezzling states give you a fixed family of states that you can use when you're trying to analyze uh, multiplayer games. Um, I don't know that anyone's actually used this for anything, but you know, in principle it works. Um, and I guess here's a, an open question. What I, want, I, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, so that in the two-player case, uh, we know that these embezzling states are only polynomially larger than uh, the original target state. Um, but in the multi-party setting, in principle, you can do the same thing, but you incur this terrible, terrible blow-up in the size of the entangled state you're talking about. So finding more efficient multi-party embezzling states, I think, would be a very interesting problem, or showing that they don't exist. Um, so a more interesting example, and this also comes from uh, Debbie's paper with John, uh, is, uh, is used to, to make a point about, uh, about, well, in this case, two-player games. In particular, showing that uh, you cannot get by with any finite amount of entanglement, at least in some games. Um, and so they look at two-player cooperative, what they call quantum games, so a slight generalization of the model that uh, most people have been talking about in this meeting where the messages between Alice and the referee uh, are, you know, are allowed to be quantum mechanical, not just classical messages. So the referee pr produces some quantum state rho, uh, which has three parts, an S part, an R part, and a T part. It gives S and T to Alice and Bob, respectively. Uh, Alice and Bob can also share some entangled state to help them along in the, in the same way that uh, people have been talking about all week. So Alice performs some physical transformation on her S register in phi and then sends back an A. But A is now quantum data, and likewise for Bob. And then the referee performs a projection, and if you, that, you know, or a measurement, and if he gets a particular outcome, he declares success. Okay? So let's try a particular uh, example of this game. Uh, so the initial state that's going to be prepared uh, by the referee is this one here. So it's an equal superposition of two possibilities. Uh, when the referee is 0, the state on S and T is a product, 0, 0. And when the referee has 1, uh, the state on S and T is going to be an entangled state. Um, now that entangled state is going to be orthogonal to 0, 0, so it's in a different sector of the Hilbert space, and it's maximally entangled. Now the objective uh, is that Alice and Bob are going to try to make a GHZ state, starting from this. right? And then the projection is going to be the projection onto this GHZ state. And so if Alice and Bob manage to make the GHZ state, they win, and if they fail, uh, then they're, they're going to lose with some, uh, some positive probability. Um, so what can we observe about this? 
Well, if Alice and Bob could apply arbitrary unitaries to their joint quantum system, then this is easy, right? Because uh, there's a unitary transformation that takes 0, 0 to 0, 0, and takes the superposition of 1, 1, and 2, 2 uh, to 1, 1. Right? That's a unitary, you know, that's a unitary transformation. So if Alice and Bob were completely unconstrained and could act, could act collectively, then they could succeed. They could make the GHZ state. But, uh, of course, they are physically separated, so they can only apply product operations. Right? Uh, and if you look at, you know, then their options look much more limited. Right? Because they, what could they do? Well, Alice could say, all right, well, in some extra register, uh, or Alice and Bob, Alice could make a 1 and Bob could make a 1, and they could swap out this state and replace it with the 1, 1 state. Right? Um, but if they were to do that, they would leave this entangled state in the environment. Right? Like it would be sitting there, uh, and it would decohere this GHZ. Right? That the, the state would look like 0, 0, 0, uh, and a 1, 1, 1, but then out in the environment, there'd also be, in the case of the 0, 0, there'd be some product state, and in the case of the 1, 1, there'd be this state here. And so there'd be something product versus something maximally entangled, and so there'd be distinguishability in the environment, uh, and you would not make the equal superposition, you'd make some kind of, some, some kind of mixture. All right? And so it's hard for them to do this uh, if, they, uh, if they're physically separated. So how, you know, how do they succeed at this task? Uh, well, we remember that they're allowed to have an entangled state to help them. And the right entangled state to choose is a really good embezzling state. Okay, so phi EDZ is a, some really high quality and universal embezzling state. Um, and then we observe that there's a local unitary transformation on S and T that will embezzle this target state psi or, uh, from the embezzling state, right? And so the inverse of that transformation will take the target and replace it with a product state, right? Uh, and so by using embezzlement, uh, they can actually, you know, but rather than embezzling, they're going to unembezzle, right? Instead of you know, taking, stealing money from the bank, they're going to run to the bank with a pile of cash and try to hide it and give it away <laughs> so that no one notices, right? Uh, and, and they can use embezzlement to do precisely that. Um, Why doesn't this disturb the zero, zero state? Oh, sorry. So the, the actual operation that is performed is a, a conditional operation. So Alice and Bob, because the 1, 1, 2, 2 sector is orthogonal, they, they know it's, yeah, so they apply the identity on this sector and then the embezzling operation yeah, on that sector. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the winning probability approaches 1 as the dimension of the embezzling state goes to infinity, which is great, right? That's interesting. Uh, but in their paper, they can also prove, again, sort of formalizing the intuition that I have been giving you, that, uh, that the success probability is bounded away from 1 uh, for, all finite dimensional you know, for all finite dimensional entangled states phi, whether they're the you know, universal embezzling state or anything else. Right? And so this is an example of a two-player game in which we know, even though that, you know, to specify the game, it's very simple and very, you know, it's only, it requires only a, pair, you know, a two by three by three dimensional system. Uh, the amount of entanglement required to play it optimal, optimally is unbounded. Uh, okay, so um, I, I, I wanted to point out actually that the idea behind that protocol uh, in, the, in this game actually uh, came up earlier and was the very first application in quantum, in quantum information at least of this embezzling idea. Um, and it was used in the proof of what's called the quantum reverse Shannon theorem. Uh, and I think it was Aaron uh, who first told me this, and I was ready to give him a hug, right? Because that was the first time you know, anyone had you know, ever even proposed that this embezzlement idea could be useful for anything. So what is this reverse Shannon theorem? Uh, so I think you know, most of the people in the audience here are familiar with information theory. If you have a channel, you allow yourself to use the channel many times, you can associate a capacity, right? The maximum rate at which you can say send bits uh, noiselessly through the channel using error correcting codes. Um, and in the quantum setting, you can do the same thing with quantum mechanical channels. And while in the classical setting, say, shared randomness between the sender and the receiver doesn't improve the capacity, in the quantum setting, entanglement between the sender and the receiver does improve the capacity. It actually makes the whole thing easier to analyze. But then you could ask a, a further question, right? Okay, so we can calculate these entanglement-assisted capacities of channels. Um, 
Once we allow ourselves free entanglement, how many different kinds of channels are there? Right? Uh, like that's you know the, the 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 capacity is just one parameter out of you know a whole bunch you know the, a whole big matrix that, that that defines the channel. And the theorem is that uh, in the presence of this uh, this entanglement, any channel uh, can simulate any other channel um, at a cost which is just given by the ratio of their capacities. Right. So that. Uh, the moral of the story is that uh, as, when you, in the quantum setting, when you allow yourself free entanglement between the sender and the receiver, there's only one parameter required to, you know, to characterize a channel. So it's a nice, it's a beautiful theorem in information theory. Uh, and this is a sort of bird's eye view of the extremely complicated protocol that they, uh, I'm not even going to begin to tell you how it works, it doesn't matter. Um, but they, the first draft of this paper I, I saw in 2001. And this is actually not just the publication date, but the date that it went on the archive. So it took them a long time to get it to work, partly because it was so complicated. But you'll see that there's this kind of subroutine in here where they have embezzling states. You know? And the issue is that they have a number of different brand, they have different protocols that they're, that they're going to try to perform in a controlled, unitary way. Uh, but the different protocols consume different amounts of entanglement. Right? And they want to do it completely coherently. And so if there's any record of how much entanglement was consumed, that would decohere the protocol, just like in the, the game that I showed you in the previous slide. And so their strategy is to take any unused entanglement <laughs> and, and unembezzle it back into the bank. Right? And that allows them to do everything coherently. Um, and so this was the, the, first, uh, the first application of embezzlement, I think, in quantum, real application. So what am I? 10? OK. So, um, Again, there, there's been a lot of really uh, yeah. good material, you know, be beautiful talks about monogamy. So I don't know that I have that much more to, to tell you. Um, but for those of you who don't, you know, who are a bit less familiar with quantum information theory, I thought I'd show you one of the most trivial uh, versions of, uh, of monogamy. Um, so the, you know, again, another one of the great laws analogous to the, uh, I guess, the first law of information or whatever it was that I was showing you earlier, uh, is that you, you cannot create entanglement without not just interaction, but quantum mechanical interaction. Right? So entanglement is, you know, we don't know exactly what it is, but we do know that it's something that uh, you can't make. You know, I can't make entanglement with Dorit by just getting on the phone and calling her in Jerusalem. Right? That we have to have some kind of quantum mechanical interaction. And you can formalize that in a way that doesn't really, the details don't matter, uh, but you can come up with a class, local operations, and classical communication. And if you're going to try to measure entanglement, Whatever it is, it's something that should not increase under these local operations in classical communication. Um, OK, so another, yeah, the other great law, the monogamy law. So every person, human, physical, or cryptographic, Alice, Alice and Bob's, whether they're actually qubits or people, doesn't matter, uh, shall be maximally entangled with at most one other person. Um, and that's you know, the monogamy statement. The more entangled Alice is with Bob, the less entangled she can be with Charlie. So we've been using that kind of language all week. But it would be nice to actually be able to have some quantity uh, that really illustrated this trade-off explicitly. So I'm just going to give you an example. Uh, and that can just give you confidence that when you try to actually use this reasoning, you're not, uh, you know, sort of going, you know, uh, you're not walking on clouds or something, right? That there's something concrete uh, that can be made, uh, made true. So since I don't have too much time, well, anyway. So th th uh, Fernando already you know, explained this uh, very nicely, but I'll do it again, because again, for people who don't do quantum information theory, this is the key point. Um, that if a quantum state is pure, all right, uh, then the only states that you can extend it with are going to be in tensor product form with that state. All right? So that's the monogamy statement. Uh, and it's just a static version of the no cloning theorem. That uh, monogamy and no cloning are, are essentially the same thing. So if you had a cloning machine, uh, you could uh, violate monogamy, right? And the, uh, the way is very simple. We would take an entangled state, run one half of it through a cloner, and then both outputs of the cloner would be entangled with A, right? Um, but likewise, if we, can, if we had polygamy, we could, uh, we could actually clone. Because if we could somehow make a, a state that was maximally entangled between A, say a qubit A, and both B1 and B2, Right? Then we could initiate teleportation and teleport phi into both copies of B. Right? And so monog you know, if you're trying to get a sense of what monogamy means, I mean, it's a property of just linear algebra, but it really is the same thing as the no cloning theorem. 
Now, to make the things quantitative, uh, I alluded to these entanglement measures earlier. Uh, so we normally try to normalize entanglement measures so that the, uh, the entanglement of a pure state is just the entropy of its reduced density operator. Uh, because right, that's, a, that's a measure of how correlated they are. The mutual information is twice this quantity. Um, and so, you know, there, are no, you know, there are tons of uh, entanglement measures that have been studied over the years. One is called the entanglement cost. And that's just the minimal rate of Bell pairs required to make copies of your target state rho AB uh, using only local operations in classical communication. Right, so that's that is the entanglement in the state in the sense of how hard is it to make the state using only LOCC? How much entanglement resource do we need to start with? And so if we wanted to prove something about monogamy, this would be a good place to start. Right? We'd say, OK, let's look at this entanglement cost function. So we could ask the question, for example, is the entanglement cost of A with B plus the entanglement cost of A with C uh, upper bounded by something useful like the entropy, right? so the ent which would be the entanglement of A with the entire rest of the world? Uh, and so morally, this should be true, right? We, we're always talking about how entanglement is monogamous. But it turns out it's not true at all. Uh, that a random pure state on a large system, A, B, C, whose uh, dimensions are all the same, have entanglement costs uh, with, between A and B and A and C that are both almost maximal, right? So you can't just naively you know, uh, say that any entanglement measure that you pick up is going to be monogamous. It's not necessarily true. Um, the sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum of the entanglement cost is the entanglement of distillation. So that is how useful a quantum state is. Right? So if I have many copies of some row AB, and I want to only use local operations and classical communications to, to extract uh, bell pairs, at what rate can I extract bell pairs? Um, and it turns out that some variant of this does obey monogamy uh, with the entanglement cost. So that the sum of the entanglement cost and the entanglement of distillation is bounded above by the entanglement of A with the rest of the world. Um, but there's a caveat, which is that I have a little arrow on there. And what that means is that I'm not, I'm not allowing all possible LOCC operations, only LOCC operations in which uh, Alice can send messages to Bob, but not the reverse. And it turns out this quantity isn't even monotonic under the general LOCC. So we've still failed to find an example of a function which sort of captures our intuition about entanglement in the mixed state case. Um, so here's a a table that is drawn from one of uh, Fernando's papers a, a few years ago. And it lists a whole pile of entanglement measures and a whole pile of desirable properties. But you'll notice monogamy in the bottom row. There's something that is yes, but then no, and no, and no, and no. That, that monogamy is actually kind of a difficult property to find for an entanglement measure. Um, but there is one that satisfies it. So I'll just tell you very briefly what is this function so that you can, you, know, you can be confident that there is at least one way of measuring entanglement that is properly monogamous. And by monogamous, I mean precisely this thing here. This quantity, they call it squashed entanglement uh, of A with a whole bunch of different Bs is at most, uh, or rather the sum of those <coughs> squashed entanglements, is at most the squashed entanglement of A with all the Bs together. And this one on its side is less than or equal to the squashed entanglement of A with the whole rest of the world, which is the entropy to the inequality I was showing earlier. And of course, that's bounded above by the dimension. OK, so uh, what should I tell you about it? Um, maybe just the definition. So uh, we've seen before this, what does it mean to be entangled? It means that you cannot be written as a convex combination of product states. right? Uh, but if we have a separable state, that is an unentangled state, we can always extend it in, in this way right here. right? So we just look at the. Our convex combination uh, has an index j. So we just remember which term in the convex decomposition we have on an extra register. And that new state, uh, for that new state, a and b are conditionally independent. Yeah. Is that well defined? I mean, if I have a state with many different, they, they, it may have many representations. Of oh, sure. Yeah, so uh, I should say, if there exists uh, a way of decomposing rho a, b as a, uh, as a convex sum of this form, then I just, I, I'm, I'm listing one particular expression. But that doesn't depend just on row. It depends on how you write it. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So it's not a function. I'm just saying, suppose you can do this. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so if you can do this, then the conditional mutual information function will be 0, right? Because once I know j, the state on a and b is a product state, right? So 
the mutual information on A and B once I know C is zero, right? Uh, and the definition of this squashed entanglement is precisely to, you know, to formalize this idea that given a state rho on A and B, we think of all possible ways of extending rho AB to larger systems, right? So we have no bound on the dimension of C. We just allow any possible extension. And we look at the infimum over all extensions of this conditional mutual information. And one can prove it's zero if and only if the state is separable, and it has that great list of, uh, of desirable properties. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you. For you. Uh, it's trivial to prove monogamy for this function here. And I'm out of time, so I'll just skip that. Uh, and say, here, you know, here's the you know, one lesson for me. If your result looks like a sneaky but useless trick, just wait for 10 years. You might be surprised at what people find, you know, how people find uses for it. I haven't spoken at all about the uh, applications of monogamy of entanglement, but I don't think you need to be convinced of these applications, right? Uh, right from the start of QKD, uh, you know, we can, and we can just choose talks at random in this workshop, and I think roughly, you know, at least one third to a half of them are using monogamy in some fundamental way. Uh, so, thanks for your attention. Just your definition of the, the last part. Yeah. Um, you, an extension, like in the general case, is defined as we add a third system such that when you trace it out, you get the original state back? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Can you explain the last uh, about the system of monogamy? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sure. Um, I mean, that's, I don't have anything very deep to, to say there. Um, but it, it's just some kind of um, some intuition that perhaps the, the rigidity theorem uh, of Umesh and Ben uh, is, is expressing the fact, you know, not, not just that the state, you know, when you're looking at the CHSH game, that the, the state you're looking at is some particular state that can't be propped with the rest of the world. But it's telling you that the entire Hilbert space and the operations that you're working with are decomposing in some tensor product fashion. So it feels to me like it, it, it's similar in spirit to monogamy, but you know, it's something much, much stronger. Um, okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, maybe we'll go to lunch and thank Patrick again.